Now that we've taken a look at the simple magnifier, we're prepared to understand how a microscope works. Here are two converging lenses. Bear in mind, as your book points out, that in an actual microscope, each of these optical elements is actually several lenses acting together as a single converging lens. So if, if you were to break apart a microscope, it would be a little more complicated than this simple model. But here's the basic idea. This is the focal length of the so-called objective lens. That's the first lens through which light passes. And this little tiny arrow is the object that you're looking at. Notice I've placed it just outside the focal point of this first lens. So this could be a biological cell that you're analyzing, a piece of hair. Um, I don't know, whatever they look at in biology classes. And you might recall that if you put an object very close to the focal point, but just outside, you will get a much enlarged, real, inverted image. As soon as you, you pop that object to the other side of the focal point, the image would appear way over there, and it would be upright and virtual. So inside the focal point, but close to the focal point, you would get a very large, upright, virtual image on the same side as the incoming light. If it's near the fo focal point, but just on the outside, you get a rather large inverted real image. So if your eyeball was right here, you could actually see this image. If you put a piece of paper here, you would see the image on the paper. If you put a piece of photographic film here, you could develop an image of, or develop a picture of the image. In this case, the idea is to enlarge it even further by using a second lens called the eyepiece, using that second lens as a simple magnifier. It's as simple as that. Look back at how the simple magnifier works. In order to take this object now, remember this is the real image which comes out of the first lens, but we're now regarding it as the object for the eyepiece. In order to take this object and blow it up into an even bigger virtual image, you would have to put this object just inside the focal point of the eyepiece. Now, in order to make this ray diagram accurate, um, I found that the focal point would actually be way out here, which is not really how a, you know, a, an actual microscope would place the object, or excuse me, the image from the first lens, they would place that much closer to the focal point for the second lens. But the idea is the same. I still get a virtual image here because this object, and remember I'm saying object, but it's the image from the first lens. This object is inside the focal point for the second lens. So there are two magnifications. There's this first lateral magnification. The first objective, or the first lens, which we call the objective, flips your object upside down, makes it bigger. This is a real image. And then your eyepiece uh, produces a virtual image of this image, which we're now considering to be the object. That's your second magnification. So an actual microscope would put this image quite a bit closer to the focal point of this eyepiece and make a much bigger virtual image, which, which would be much further to, to the left. Remember, it's basically at infinity. If you, put, if you put your object at the focal point or just inside the focal point of a converging lens, you're going to get a virtual image at infinity, which is infinitely tall, and that's the scenario in which it would make more sense to talk about angular magnification, capital M, rather than lateral magnification, lowercase m. So let's take a look at the graphic from your book explaining some of this. Okay. Keep in mind, I think most of you have used microscopes. The objective lens is here, and rather than having a straight tube up to the eyepiece, you know, then you'd have to bend over and the muscles in your neck would get sore. So they do uh, reflect the image using total internal reflection inside a prism and have it come out the other end. Here's the eyepiece. So the model that we're using, just take this, this bent shape, straighten it out. Here's your first lens, here's your second lens. And the distance between the lenses from the objective to the eyepiece, that's called the tube length. Your book calls it L, and you'll notice that I guess they're defining the tube length slightly different than that. Um, 
the tube length starts somewhere between the objective lens and the focal length of the objective lens. But um, what's one thing that's true for these microscopes is both of these lenses tend to have very short focal lengths on the order of just a few millimeters, three, four, five millimeters. And that means, you know, an actual microscope here, this is uh, something like 15 to 20 centimeters, which would be 150 to 200 millimeters. That's much longer than those very short focal lengths. So if we look at the, the image that comes out of the objective, it's supposed to be way over here, just inside the focal point of this eyepiece. So this diagram is not to scale, but they can't make it to scale, otherwise the ray diagram would be really confusing to look at. But keep in mind that this, this object, which is the image from the first lens, this is practically, as they've shown, it's right on top of the focal length of the eyepiece. So this distance in actuality would be a lot less than it looks like it is. Th this distance is very small, just a few millimeters compared to something like 160 millimeters. And that means the distance between, the, the whole point I'm making here is that the distance between the objective lens and the image that it forms is practically equal to the tube length. So the microscope is designed, it's manufactured so that the image from this first lens will show up practically at the right side of the tube. And that means the image distance, S1 prime, is basically L, the tube length. And how is that accomplished? Well, if you go back to the thin lens equation, okay, the, the objective lens has a particular focal length. So if you want your image distance to be basically L, the, the length of the tube in your microscope, that's the distance between the two lenses, that would require a particular distance. Well, the object distance is determined by how far the, the microscope slide is placed from the, uh, the objective lens. When you use a microscope, you set that slide with your specimen or your sample, you set it up on that little stage. And that stage has a particular distance from the, from the objective lens. And if I recall correctly, you, know, you can turn a knob and move that stage up and down until this dis distance is just right so that the image comes out at just the right place in the tube so that it's at the focal point of the eyepiece. I think that's how it all works. Okay, so let's, let's look at the magnification then, the total magnification. Let's start with the magnification of the objective. I'll call that M1. And we just determined that this image distance should be basically the length of the tube because you want your image to show up at the other side of the tube, right at the very small focal length uh, of, the, of the eyepiece. So this would be negative L over S1. Okay, S1. Now what do we do with that? Um, oh, right, if we go back to the diagram, remember you want a very large in inverted real image coming out of that objective. The whole purpose of the microscope is to blow this thing up, magnify it. And to do that, you would have to put this specimen very close to the focal point. So the distance from specimen to lens is practically the same as that first focal length. And that's why we will replace S1 with the focal length of the objective lens. Then we go to the eyepiece, which is being used as a simple magnifier. So we can quote the result from my previous video. The magnification, maybe I should emphasize, this is the lateral magnification of uh, the objective. That's a distance over distance. Now we're talking about the angular magnification of the eyepiece. The eyepiece is being used as a simple magnifier in that first configuration that we talked about where the idea is to place the image which comes out of the eyepiece at infinity so that your eye can be in its relaxed state 
and still focus on that image. And for that, the formula was capital M for angular magnification. Uh, that's the angular size of the final image over the angular size of this guy. And then I'll remind you, that would be the angular size of this thing if viewed at your near point. What you could do is get rid of the eyepiece. Um, that would be an, kind of an odd microscope, but you could just have this first lens and you could see this to, it, by looking down the tube. It just wouldn't be nearly as large as if you then magnified it. So if you place this real image at your near point, you would still get some magnification, but not as much as if you used the second lens. Okay, anyway, you can review the video previously or read about it in your book. This is the same as near point, which is off to 25 centimeters, divided by the focal length of the lens you're talking about. In this case, it would be the focal length of the eyepiece. Okay, so we put all those together. Total magnification. And what's the symbol that your book uses? Well, they just call it capital M. So actually we need to amend this, this symbol. Uh, capital M still for magnification, but this is purely the magnification of the eyepiece. The total magnification, they, they decide to go with the capital M because part of that magnification is in fact an angular magnification. It would be the, the lateral magnification of the objective. And yeah, they actually decided to call this OBJ, magnification of the objective lens, times the angular magnification of the eyepiece. We just multiply them together. So you take this, multiply it by that, and there is going to be a minus sign in that final formula. The minus sign just tells you that your final image is inverted with respect to the actual object. It really doesn't matter for biology, does it? You know, if you're looking at a, a little paramecium, does it really make a difference if it's upside down? Not so much. Okay, so there it is. That's a formula that uh, you, I do not have memorized. Throw that on a note card, um, or at least have it someplace where you can refer to it. Know how to use it. You do want to understand the ray diagram behind how a microscope works. And there's an example in your book, example 35.6. I don't really like the way they, they uh, explain the answer, so I'm going to go through that with an alternate explanation. But let's take a look at the formula here. Do we have control over the magnification with a microscope? You can't change the tube length. I mean, mo most microscopes, that's not an option. And you can't really change your near point, but what you could do is reduce either of these. If you switch the focal length of the objective, make it smaller, that would make this entire number bigger. Or if you reduced the focal length of the eyepiece, that would also make this entire thing bigger. And in practice, I think the way most microscopes work, you tend to stick with one eyepiece. I don't think you normally would swap out the eyepiece. When it comes to telescopes, yes, that's very easy. So telescopes, it's very easy to swap out the eyepiece. Micro microscopes, it's the opposite. We'll go back to the picture in the book here. Oops. Gotta hit the share button. Awkward pause. Do, 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 boop, 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 boop. Here we go. For those of you who have recently used a microscope. You recall this turret? Hey, you've got some options here. You can choose from among several different objective lenses. So it's easiest actually to, to change the focal length of the objective lens. And that would give you different options for magnifications. And your book points out that standard microscopes have a, a set of possible values for this first lateral magnification. Often it's something like 10 times magnification, 40 times, 100 times, and then you compound that with the 10 times magnification of the eyepiece. Now, maybe you're thinking, hey, you can't get 10 times out of a simple magnifier because we just looked at that in the previous video. Uh, supposedly, the best you can do is four or five times with a simple magnifier. Well, that's true 
if your simple magnifier is a single converging lens. But remember, the eyepiece lens is actually uh, a collection of lenses. It's, it's a little more complicated. I don't know the details. I've actually never learned about them. If you go major in optics or get a graduate degree in optics, I'm sure you'll know all about that. Okay, so in practice, you change the focal length of the objective. Now, when you keep in mind the thin lens equation, one over S plus one over S prime equals one over S. We already know that this needs to be basically the two blanks. You need your image to pop out right at the focal point of the eyepiece, which is not gonna change because you're not swapping the eyepiece. That means if you change the focal length of your objective, the object distance of the objective would also need to change. How is that supposed to work with the practical microscope? Let's go back to the picture once more. Well, I could be wrong here, but I suspect that each of these barrels has a slightly different length to account for that. Um, so that, you know, if you were to rotate the turret, automatically your object distance would adjust so that the image is still in focus. If that's not how it works, no problem. You still just have this focus knob. Turning the focus knob, I, if I recall correctly, will move the stage up or down, which adjusts the object distance, S, for the objective lens. All right, so there's no mystery here. Uh, really, the only thing that we're not taking into account here, taking account of, would be the fact that each of these lenses is actually a collection of lenses. If you want to know those details, we'll have to go a little deeper into the problem. But that's how a microscope works. So I'm going to take a look at the example in your book, 35.6. Here's the problem. A pathologist is looking at a very tiny human blood cell that's seven micrometers in diameter. It's amazing to think how many of those you've got flowing through those tiny... Uh, what are they called, capillaries? Super tiny blood vessels? Okay, it's seven micrometers in diameter. What's a micrometer? One millionth of a meter, which would be one thousandth of a millimeter. Remember, when you look at a meter stick, the smallest little division you see is a millimeter. So seven thousandths of that. I don't think you can see that without the, uh, the aid of a microscope. You need to look under a microscope to see that. Also keep in mind your hair is something like 50 micrometers thick. And you can barely see the thickness of a hair. So seven compared to 50. Okay, she's got a 40 times magnification objective and a 10 times magnification eyepiece. If I go back to my notes here, M of the objective is 40 times and the angular magnification of the eyepiece is 10 times. So the total magnification would be the product of those two. That's just 400. Okay, so that, uh, that seven micrometer diameter human blood cell is going to look 400 times bigger than it would, is that quite what it means? Not exactly, this problem's a little subtle. And like I said, I don't really like the way the book explained it. So just review, the magnification of the objective, image distance over object distance, that's a lateral magnification. The image that comes out of the objective lens should be about one, uh, same distance from the objective as the tube length. It's supposed to show up at the opposite end of the tube. And the object distance, remember, your little specimen, in this case, the human blood cell, is just outside the focal length, so the distance is practically equal to the focal length. And they tell you that a typical tube length is 160 millimeters, which would be 16 centimeters. But we don't actually need this. What are they really asking here? What other object placed at your near point would look as big as the blood cell as seen through the microscope. So if you take this tiny little blood cell and look at it through the eyepiece of this microscope with the settings that they gave, 
that's going to be as large in your field of view as what other object viewed at your near point. So think about it. Um, if you had a rubber eraser, okay, it's not actually rubber, whatever this is. If you had a, an eraser and you put it at the near point of your eye, that's rather close to your face. That's going to be pretty large in your field of view. That will occupy, I think, at least half of your field of view. I don't expect the red blood cell to appear to be that big in your field of view as you look through the eyepiece. So here's how I think about it. The objective takes your seven micrometer tall uh, human blood cell, magnifies it to a real image, which is supposed to be, remember, 40 times as big. They, they told us that the magnification of the objective is, is 40 times. So seven micrometers times 40 would be 280 micrometers. Well, for every uh, one millimeter, there are 1,000 micrometers, right? Takes a thousand micrometers, millions of meter to get one thousandth of a meter. In other words, 0.28 millimeters. That's awful close to 0.3. Let's just round that to 0.3 millimeters. Okay, well, that's actually getting to something large enough that you could see. Uh, you can easily see one millimeter on a ruler, even on the camera here you should have no problem distinguishing. Okay, it's a little bit blurry, but each of these millimeters can easily be resolved with your eye. A third of a millimeter? Barely, but I think you could still see that. But that's not much magnification. So the second thing that gets done with the microscope is when you look at the eyepiece, it functions as a simple magnifier. So this, this uh, 0.3 millimeter image, which you could see by just looking, you know, if you got rid of the eyepiece and looked down the tube of the microscope, you could still see that, but it's not very big, let's blow it up even more. Let's blow it up 10 times. Remember this eyepiece is gonna accomplish a 10 times magnification. So 0.3 millimeters times the 10 times magnification of the eyepiece would give you three millimeters. Okay, so this, Uh, yeah, and this is the tough part of the question, I think, conceptually. Once again, they're asking what object placed at your near point would look as big as the final magnified image of this blood cell looks. So if you remove the eyepiece of the microscope, you could just look down the tube and move your head around until the real image, which comes out of the first lens, is at your near point. Um, but the, the eyepiece blows that up to form an even bigger virtual image. So let's call this your 0.3 millimeter image, which came out of the first lens. And the, the function of the simple magnifier, which we call the eyepiece, is to increase the angular size of that by a factor of 10. So you produce a virtual image over here so that the angle that it makes is 10 times bigger than the angular, angular size of that 0.3 millimeter real image. And they're asking, what actual object placed here would, would appear to be 10 times, also 10 times as big as that 0.3 millimeters. So what's not obvious here, and, and this really is not true, strictly speaking, for large angles, but if you put an object here that was 10 times as tall as that, then it would have the same angular size as this virtual image. Uh, they're asking us to use this property of small angle triangles. If I've got a right triangle like this, uh, if I increase the height of this thing by a factor of five, let's say, this angle is roughly five times this angle if this height is roughly five times that height. 
you know, that's that becomes more and more accurate as these angles become smaller. It's, it's not true. You know, you could look at the tangent function and show that that's not really true by the time you get to angles like 60 degrees compared to uh, six degrees, for instance. Okay, so I probably just confused you, but the idea is think of this as the near point for somebody's eye over here. You could just look at the real image coming out of the objective lens without the eyepiece and you would still get some magnification, but now you're going to blow that up by making a virtual image with the eyepiece. And the, because we're told that the eyepiece has a magnification of 10, the angular size of that last virtual image is supposed to be 10 times the angular size of the real image from the first objective lens if you put it at your near point. And they're asking what object placed at your near point, what size object would look as big in your field of view as that final virtual image looks? Well you would have to put something at your near point, which is 10 times as tall as that real image in order to sub 10 the same angle in your field of view. That's, that's actually a little uh, confusing, I think. Well, the, the real image here we determined was 0.3 millimeters. So you'd have to put something at your near point, which is about three millimeters tall, three compared to 0.3 is a ratio of 10. Okay, three millimeters at your near point. That's like, I don't know, that's like the length of this uh, little piece of lead that I put out. So if you were to hold this at your near point, 25 centimeters away from your face, yeah, that's easily visible, that makes sense. That, that could be about the size of a specimen under a microscope. Okay, so the only way to, to really answer this question effectively is to understand what both of these lenses are doing in a microscope. One of them produces a real image, which you could just place at your near point and you would still get some magnification because this real image is larger than this. You know, putting, putting the seven micrometer diameter blood cell at your near point, you wouldn't see anything, but you might see this. Even better would be to take that real image and give it some angular magnification with the eyepiece, which makes it actually big enough to see easily. The other important optical instrument with which you should be familiar is the telescope. You can also make a telescope out of two converging lenses, just like a microscope. Of course, a microscope is meant to magnify super small things uh, and produce a virtual image. A telescope is meant to uh, first produce a very small image of something that may be large but very far away and then magnify that image. And I've learned over the years that it's difficult to understand the books or these books, these various books, explanations of how a telescope works. If I've got pictures in mind from, well, look, let me show you what I mean. I'll show you a graphic from the book. If I try to conceptualize how a telescope works with pictures like this in mind, I get confused. Here is a, a thin lens being used to produce an image of an object that is relatively nearby and not particularly big. Not only that, but the, the top of the object is not that far from the optical axis. When you use a telescope, that first lens, the objective lens, it's gathering light from something that is much further away, much farther away. And also that object could be extremely large. It could be the size of a planet or a galaxy. So I'd like to show you a series of lame little sketches here to make it easier to understand the ray diagram that we will eventually use to drive the formula for the magnification of a telescope. Let's start with this one. Yeah, I've drawn here three, yeah, one, two, three different converging lens. I didn't actually sketch the lenses. I'm just using a vertical line. And each of these lenses has the same focal length, but I'm putting the object farther and farther from the lens in each case. So I've drawn three principal rays. You can see that they intersect right here. So this object, which is placed well outside the focal point, produces an image which is very reduced in size. It's also inverted and you'll note, if I were to draw in the image, it's really close to the focal point. 
So the first thing we should observe is that for an object distance significantly greater than the focal length, and I would say this counts, this object distance is, I don't know, seven or eight times the focal length. If that's the case, your image distance comes out to be basically the focal length. My image here is almost right at the, uh, the focal point on the opposite side. That's going to be true for all three of these. That's one observation to make. Uh, this last drawing is a little sloppy, sloppier than the other two. But the other thing I'd like you to, to notice here is as you take the tip of this arrow and put it further away, these incoming rays become more and more parallel. That's not real obvious from this diagram because this, this ray is clearly not parallel to this ray. It's a little easier to see for this last one, or is it? Yeah, these are still not very parallel. On the back though, I've drawn a more realistic scenario. What if this was the lens of a telescope, the you know, objective lens perhaps, or you're just looking at something through a single lens. Maybe this is the window of a building sufficiently far away that if I draw my three principal rays, see I've got the ray that's undeviated going through the center, I've got the ray comes in, that comes in parallel and refracts through the focal point. And then that last ray is the one that goes through the near focal point here and then comes out parallel. It's diff difficult to even distinguish these two rays. And I've got an image formed practically at the focal point on the opposite side. But here you really can tell that these rays are becoming more parallel. If I then took this point and dragged it 50 miles away, these lines would be effectively parallel. So keep in mind that when you're looking at an object point that's very far away, all of the, the light rays entering the lens of your telescope, the, obje object, excuse me, the objective lens, those rays are effectively parallel. The next thing to take note of is the fact that the object that you may be looking at, in this case, just imagine a, a large mountain, could be much greater in lateral dimension than is your lens. In chapter 34, all of the ray diagrams that we're presented with show objects that are smaller than the lens itself. I'll go back to the picture from chapter 34. See the, the height of this tree or shrub, whatever it is, it's actually less than the sideways dimension of the lens. And that can be confusing or misleading when you try to relate that to how a telescope works. So suppose this is the objective lens of a telescope and you're looking at a hill far away. Of course, a real hill would be much taller even than this. It's possible to image this entire thing, even though it's much greater in size than the lens. Um, each of these object points, here's a point near the top of the hill. If you draw rays going to the top and bottom of the lens, every other ray from this point that actually makes it through the lens has to be a ray that's between these two. Sure, there are rays going in this direction, this direction, this direction, but these will completely miss the lens. There's a bunch of rays in between these two that will pass through the lens and make an image point somewhere over here. But you'll notice that these rays are almost parallel. And the farther away this hill is, the more parallel, parallel these rays become. Same thing for an object point down here. So here's a bundle of parallel rays, almost parallel rays. It's coming in at a different direction than the bundle of parallel rays over here. And for that purpose, I've drawn this picture. In the, uh, in the beginning of chapter 34, when we first developed the thin lens equation, we talk about paraxial rays, a bundle of rays coming in parallel to the so-called optical axis. Something your book doesn't talk too much about because you know they're trying to save space, is you could have a bundle of rays coming in from some other direction than the optical axis. This is not the optical axis because it doesn't pass through the, the center of the lens. But the action of the lens on this bundle is very similar. These rays will still be brought to a single point or roughly a single point somewhere behind the lens. And that point almost coincides with what we normally think of as the, the focal point. If you were to draw a really, uh, a really careful diagram of a thin lens, get a protractor out, get a fine tipped 
writing instrument and apply Snell's law correctly with a protractor, you could probably show that the focal point for these rays is slightly different than the one for these rays, but close enough. So parallel rays from any direction will be focused more or less at the focal point. And lastly, what confused me the most when I tried to, tried to relate those ray diagrams originally to the use of a telescope was the fact that when you look through a telescope, you're often looking at multiple objects. You know, maybe you've got the moon centered in the field of view of your telescope, which means that the, the moon would actually lie on the optical axis. But for anybody who's looked through a telescope, you know that you can see many stars at a time. You can see a planet and stars. So what if within the field of view of the telescope, you see the moon in the center, but other objects off to the side? How are we supposed to, to apply the thin lens equation in that case? Well, just consider a single object of overall height h, but maybe you've got a, a height h1 and a height h2. So what I've done is draw two principal rays from each of these points. Look at the top point. I drew a ray that's undeviated through the center. I drew a ray that uh, passes through the near focal point and then comes out parallel. And I was able to determine that the image point of this object point is right here. And that the image point of this object point is right here. So if I call this uh, H1, and this is H2, this would be H1 prime, and this would be H2 prime. Each of those heights has an associated image height as well. So instead of talking about the entire object, I'm talking about an object point with its corresponding image point, object point, image point. Okay, well, what if this being, uh, a single extended object, instead of being an ex a single extended object, what if the object in question actually lies between these points? Back to this diagram. Venus, for instance, what if as you look through the telescope with the moon at the center of the field of view, you can see Venus off to the side? Well, the distance from the optical axis to the bottom of Venus, that could be like H1, and the distance from the optical axis to the top of Venus could be H2. So what I've done is, first of all, remind you that the image height can be calculated as mag magnification times object height. And for a thin lens, the magnification is just the ratio of the image and object distances. And then recall from one of these previous diagrams that I just showed you, let's see which one. This one, for instance, as soon as your object is sufficiently far from the lens, your image distance is really, really, really close to the focal length. And that's certainly true for something as far away as the moon. So I've replaced the image distance by F, the focal length. And now, if I were to apply this same formula to the bottom and the top of Venus, you see that the bottom and the top are essentially the same distance from the lens. In fact, this whole scene could be thought of as being the same distance from the lens. So S wouldn't change. The object dist distance would not change. Of course, it's the same focal length in each case because it's the same lens. And I could really just take the, the differential of both sides of this equation, and I would find that the, the change in the image height is this ratio times the change in the object height. So by object height, I really mean uh, the bottom of Venus has a particular object height, object point height from the optical axis, and the top as its own object point height. And the difference between those two, this is what I would call delta H. And I didn't finish the drawing, but over here, those two image points would have a small distance between them. I could call that delta H prime. So this could be a very large number. What if, I mean, if delta H is the, the actual distance from the top of Venus to the bottom of Venus, then we're talking about the diameter of Venus. This is a very large number indeed, close to the diameter of planet Earth. But, the focal length of your telescope, you know, that may be one or two meters. We're going to look at that. But two meters divided by the distance to Venus, this is an extremely small ratio. So you take something like the diameter of Venus, scale it down to a very small number, 
This would be the size of the actual real image produced over here. The objective lens of your telescope could produce a real image that you could uh, project onto photographic film with a CCD of a digital camera, et cetera. So you get a very small image, real image, of something that's enormous in actual life. So for me, I, I couldn't really reconcile the ray diagrams that we're going to look at with the thin lens equation until I looked at this. It's like the differential of the formula that gives image height in terms of object height. Here is the ray diagram that's presented in your book to explain how a telescope works. This is on page 1007. We're looking at a simple model of a refracting telescope. Refraction, refracting because we've got two lenses. Most large telescopes that are actually used for astronomical research actually uh, involve a mirror, a giant mirror as the objective. You may still have uh, a thin lens as the eyepiece, but We'll get to that later. Okay, there's a lot going on in this diagram. These are parallel rays coming from far away. And when you first look at it, you think, well, these three rays are coming from three different places. But remember, a single object point, like the middle of Venus, when you take that object point really far away, these rays become parallel. So all three of these rays, think of them as actually coming from the same point. Now, if I go back to this diagram, for instance, imagine a bunch of rays coming out of the bottom of Venus here. Let me draw two more. So all three of these rays that I'm gonna draw are striking different parts of the lens, but they're all being converged to a single point on the other side of the lens. And we've already shown that that single point is very close to the focal point. Remember, it doesn't matter which direction those rays are coming from. As long as they're somewhat paraxial, they're going, they're going to converge near the focal point. Okay, so these rays don't look parallel, but they're, they're not too far from being parallel. If you took Venus as far away as it really is, to be, these rays would look parallel as do these. So again, think of all three of these rays as coming from a single point on the object that you're looking at. Now, they've defined this angle theta. You can see from vertical angles, this is also theta. See, this, this ray is undeviated as it passes through the lens. The bottom and top rays are deviated, but hopefully you see that this angle is the same as this angle. When all these rays meet over here, we've got a right triangle. So I'm going to trace this out a couple of times. Hypotenuse, and here are the other two sides. So hypotenuse, and here are the other two sides. This distance, H prime, your book will refer to that as the image distance. I'm going to call it the image point distance because remember, H would be the distance from the optical axis to this single point on the object that you're looking at. And that single point will have an associated image point over here. So this is the, the distance from the optical axis to the image point of that one object point. And the small angle approximation says that tangent of theta is basically equal to theta. Well, tangent of theta would be opposite over adjacent. Opposite is what we're calling H prime. And the adjacent side, well, that's the distance between the image point and the lens. And we know that that's more or less very, very close to the focal length of that lens, the focal length of the objective. Okay, so we're going to save that for later. And here's a, a rather subtle point that your book kind of casually mentions. This is the angle subtended between the object point, which is for me the bottom of Venus, and the optical axis. That's the angle subtended as seen from the lens. But think about it. The lens is attached to a telescope. The telescope is sitting on planet Earth. Even if you're standing five feet away from the telescope, five miles away from the telescope, 5,000 miles away from the telescope, 
this angle is going to be practically the same. Can I sketch that real quick? Yeah. If this is planet Earth, and here is Venus, here's a bunch of incoming parallel rays from a single point on Venus. We call this angle theta. It doesn't matter whether you, you look at that angle as seen by the lens of your telescope or as seen by you standing five miles away. That's not going to change. So if, if I drew parallel rays from Venus to wherever you're standing, theta is going to be the same. And this isn't even to scale, right? Like if this is the Earth, even the moon is off the page. Venus is so far away, it doesn't make a difference whatsoever. So this angle theta would still be the angle between the optical axis and the bottom of Venus as seen by your eyeball too. Okay. Well, now let's look at this angle theta prime because the eyepiece here, just like in the microscope, the eyepiece is being used as a simple magnifier. This is a real image. And again, this is what I find confusing. Um, don't let this arrow mislead you. It's not like I've got some large arrow over here, which is my object. And then here, this is the image of the entire thing. I'm just thinking of this arrow as locating the image point, just a single image point associated with the object point. And that point would be, you know, the bottom of, a little point on the bottom of Venus. Okay. Well, what is the angle between the optical axis and the direction to that point? We can use this right triangle right here. And let's look at the ray tracing for the image produced or the image formed by the eyepiece. So here's the real image from the objective, which serves as the object for the eyepiece. This ray is undeviated, just continues on. But the ray that comes in parallel to the optical axis refracts through the far focal point. So these, this ray appears to be coming from back here. This ray appears to be coming from back here. And you can see these two rays, if you ask yourself, where would, they, uh, where would they appear to be diverging from way back here? Hopefully you watched the video about simple magnifier and you read this in the book. These two rays would have to be diverging from some point infinitely far that way. So the eyepiece acts as a simple magnifier and forms an infinitely tall image infinitely far away. And the, the angular distance between the top of that image and the optical axis is this angle. See how right here, the angle that this ray makes with the optical axis is the same as this angle. So that this would be the angular size of the distance between the optical axis and the image point of the bottom of Venus. And we can use this triangle to get that angle. The tangent of theta prime is basically just theta prime. And you might be thinking, well, this doesn't look like a small angle. That's because if we, if we actually drew this diagram with small angles, it would be too difficult to interpret. So we've exaggerated all the angles. That's going to be h prime over this distance. h prime over, well, what is this distance? That's the distance from the eyepiece to its focal point. In other words, the focal length of the eyepiece. Notice how the telescope is constructed here, the tube length. The distance from the eyepiece to the objective lens is just F1 or F objective plus F eyepiece. It's just the sum of the focal lengths. Okay, we're almost at the formula that your book gives. We are trying to determine a formula for the angular magnification of this telescope. But I'm going to throw out one little twist in there, one little step, because I find the book's explanation a little unsatisfactory. Your book is calling this theta, and they treat that as the object angular size. I don't like that because the way I've drawn the diagram, that's really the angle between the optical axis and the bottom of Venus. The angular size, if this was your eyeball, the angular size of the actual planet that you're looking at or star would be this tiny angle. So if, if this was theta one and this was theta two, the difference between them is actually the angular size. I could call this delta theta. It's the difference in the angles from the optical axis to the bottom of Venus and the optical axis to the top of 
between. So I'm going to call that delta theta. I, I find that more intuitive. And so all I have to do is uh, take the differential of both sides here. I'll use this part of the paper to do that. Remember, h prime is the distance from the optical axis to the location of the image point of, uh, for instance, the bottom point on Venus. So if I take the delta of both sides, well, the focal length doesn't change, but I would have the delta of theta and the delta of h prime. So I'm going to write it this way. I'll take the differential of both sides and call this change in theta is change in h prime over f objective. So for me, the, the delta of h prime, that would actually be the, the diameter of the image of Venus formed on the, let's say if you were using this telescope to take a photograph, formed on the photographic film. Remember this business, delta h, if, if this is the actual diameter of Venus, then delta h prime, which I didn't label, but delta h prime would be the size of the image produced at the focal point of the objective. Okay, so once again, this would be the actual angular size of Venus for a person standing on planet Earth. This would be the actual lateral dimension of the image of that planet formed by the objective. You know, you could hold up a piece of paper right here and see that image. As a matter of fact, uh, some nights when I've used the telescope to look at the moon, uh, if it was a full moon, the light was so bright that if you happen to kick up some dust, if you were looking out or you know, viewing from outdoors and you kicked up some dust and there were a cloud of dust near the focal point, you can actually see the image formed or reflecting off the, the dust that's near the eyepiece. So it is a real image, not a virtual image. Okay, and we do the same thing with this expression. You're going to have a theta prime for the virtual image associated with the bottom point of Venus, and then you would have a different theta prime for the virtual image associated with the top of Venus. I want the difference between those two. So I would do, once again, take the delta of both sides, delta theta prime equals delta h prime over f i piece. This is the angular size of Venus viewed by a person who is not using the telescope. This is the angular size of Venus as seen by somebody who is looking through the eyepiece. We're looking at that second virtual image formed by the eyepiece. And the magnification of the telescope, of course, would be what's the angular size of Venus as viewed through the telescope? What's the angular size of Venus when viewed without the telescope, take the ratio of those two and you'll find that the delta H primes cancel as they should. The magnification should not depend on which object you're looking at. And I get F objective over F eyepiece. This is the formula in your book. The difference is in your book, they don't call these delta theta prime they call it theta prime. Maybe you find their explanation perfectly sufficient, but for me, it left something to be, to be desired the more I thought about it. This is very different from the magnification of a microscope. You might recall that for a microscope, the formula for the magnification has both focal lengths in the denominator, suggesting that if you wanna get greater magnification with the microscope, you would need uh, to shorten either focal length. Here, how do you get the largest magnification possible? You actually want a very long focal length associated with the objective and as short a focal length as possible for the eyepiece. So I will pull up an image of a, a typical design for a refracting telescope. This is a bit of a, a cartoonish diagram, but here's an image of a refracting telescope, also referred to as simply a refracting diagram, the light is coming in from the right. Usually when I draw these diagrams, the light's coming in from the left, so you have to flip things around. But these rays are coming from something very far away, like planet Venus. The rays come in parallel. They pass through the objective lens. And the distance from here to the lens would be F objective. You can see how long the focal length of the objective lens is compared to the focal length of the 
eyepiece. And this really isn't pronounced enough. In actuality, this distance could be one hundredth of this distance. Very often, the eyepieces have a focal length of something like 20 millimeters or 30 millimeters. That's the, tel the telescope that we often use for the uh, astronomy department here at Long Beach City College. Um, I typically use a, an eyepiece with a focal length of 25 millimeters, but the focal length of the objective could be two and a half meters. That would be 2,500. So 2,500 compared to 25, yeah, that's a ratio of 100 to one. Okay, so that, that's a good number to memorize that the focal length of the objective is something like 100 times the focal length of the eyepiece. This is a very simple telescope design. The, remember, one thing missing from this diagram is when these rays refract through the eyepiece, they actually form a virtual image that's way over here in this direction. Um, and so the person viewing through the eyepiece, they're looking at that ginormous virtual image. So first we form a real image here, a very tiny real image, and then that real image is magnified using the eyepiece. So something I also found confusing at first when I thought about how this telescope works is, how exactly are you magnifying anything if the objective lens actually makes a real image that's, that's very reduced in size? I mean, the real image that you get right here is extremely small compared to Venus. I mean, Venus is, I don't know, 5,000 miles across, but you're looking at a, a real image through an eyepiece, and that real image is just a few millimeters across. Well, obviously you can't produce an image of Venus that's as big as Venus, that, that's ridiculous. It has to be something that, that fits within your field of view. So for me, the ray diagram is the most convincing thing. And I'll point this out now, a lot of you may have the impression that, that the main purpose of a telescope is to magnify. And that's really not the case because you don't actually get impressive magnifications out of a telescope. It doesn't have to be anywhere near a thousand times. Um, the, the main purpose of the, of the telescope is to gather a lot of light. The diameter of the, the objective is often much bigger than the, uh, the diameter of your pupil. So it's like a giant eyeball that allows you to gather a lot of light and see very faint objects in greater detail. And that has to do with the resolution. That's the last topic we'll look at in this chapter is, is resolving power of optical instruments. And I will point out now that most large astronomical telescopes, I think I said this a moment ago, do not actually use two lenses. If they're meant for observation by a human, you know, using their eyeballs, they often use a mirror and a lens. And this is even more complicated so that the diagram you're seeing here, there is no lens and there's actually two mirrors. Let me explain. Um, this is considered the objective. It has the same, it serves the same purpose as that first lens. The first lens, which we call the objective, is supposed to form a real inverted image real inverted image. Now, get rid of this secondary mirror in your mind for a moment. Imagine that that's gone. The rays that reflect off of this mirror would form a real inverted image over here somewhere. Hopefully you've done a couple homework problems about concave mirrors. A concave mirror will focus parallel rays just as a thin lens does. So the uh, F objective would be the focal length of that first concave mirror. That would tend to form an image way back here somewhere. But that image is supposed to then be magnified by an eyepiece so that a person can, can look at it. And what are you going to do, climb inside the telescope here? So that, that's no good. What they do instead are one common design. This is called a Cassegrain design. This is a Cassegrain telescope. You have a secondary mirror that causes a second reflection. So the, the real image formed by the primary actually shows up over here. And then you would mount an eyepiece right back here, use the eyepiece as a sim simple magnifier and form an enlarged virtual image of the real image formed right here. Okay, so your eyepiece would be right here with a short focal length. Here's the eyepiece. And you can see there's an additional reflection there so that you don't have to squat down and, and look along this axis, you could be kind of standing up and leaning over 
looking through the eyepiece here. So there's obviously a couple extra layers of complication here. This is called a finder scope. It's not actually necessary. Anyway, telescopes are fun. You can get a telescope like this for not a whole lot of money. Although, uh, they're called Dobsonians. Let me pull up an image of a Dobsonian real quick. I said Dobsonian, but this, uh, this telescope design is also referred to as a Newtonian telescope. I'm assuming Newton was the first to come up with this, but you'll notice instead of uh, using the secondary mirror to bounce the image out over here, they've actually sent the image produced, that's the real image produced by the objective, out the side of the telescope. So right here is where that real image would form. And there's an eyepiece mounted here. Just think of this as a single converging lens used as a simple magnifier. And you know, you may have been wondering in the previous diagram, can I pull that up? No, I'm having trouble with the, with the browser because uh, Zoom is in the way. But you may be thinking, wait a minute, how can you send the image through the objective and have it form over here? Well, there's a hole in the primary mirror through which the image passes and some thought would be required to, to realize that that hole doesn't have to produce a hole in the image. You still have right, light rays being collected everywhere else. So let's calculate a typical telescope magnification. I mentioned that, that the, it's actually a schmidt cassegrain telescope that we have in the department here. Very similar to the diagram I just showed you. It's got a focal length of over two meters and the eyepiece that we often use is 25 millimeters, that would be 25 times 10 to the negative third meters. And I believe I already did this calculation. Hang on a second. 2,500 millimeters divided by 25 millimeters, right. Okay, so it's a rather modest 100. But that's still going to allow you to see much greater detail on the surface of the moon, for instance, and you can see by yourself. Even a telescope like this would allow you to clearly see the four so-called Galilean moons of Jupiter. When you look at Jupiter with the naked eye, you just see that one dot of light, that's Jupiter. But with a little bit of magnification, you can, you can distinguish four moons going around that planet. How much of this previous discussion do you need to understand when it comes to telescope problems? Well, at the very least, you need to know the formula for the magnification. You need to know what the two lenses do. The objective lens forms a, a real inverted image that's very small. It's a very small real image of something that's probably very large and very far away. And then the eyepiece um, uses that image as its object and produces a second virtual image, which is really far away and really tall, but has a fixed angular size. So it's a lot like the simple magnifier. The, the end result is what we care about is the angular magnification.